better. You know, we try to stand on our own so many times when we realize that we are truly dependent on God and um, we're not self-made anything. Um, we, we go a lot farther in life when we realize that He is everything and we need Him so much. If you have your Bibles this morning, if you'll turn to Daniel uh, chapter 2. Uh, this morning I want to go through the entire life of this person. So we're going we're gonna to cover, you notice the verse reference on the screen there. Um, it's actually chapter 2, 3, and 4. Um, so we're going to be using a lot of passages this morning, a lot of verses. But I really believe the lesson that we can learn from this guy's life is incredible. So again, you actually need to look at his entire life to, to see what's going on here. So there comes a point in every person's life, <clears throat> no matter who you are, where they look back over the years and evaluate their existence. And maybe you've been there, I've been there, when you stop and look back and go, um, what am I accomplishing? What's my purpose? What, what am I actually doing in life? You know, who am I? And is my existence actually benefiting or is it hurting? And we all think, we all think about that from time to time. They look back and wonder, did they have a good life or did they waste their life on trivial things? You know, how, what are we, how are we doing? Did they love people like they should have loved them or did they throw relationships away over th things that they really didn't matter? We, we get to, at the end of our lives, we step back and it's usually the time where everything begins to come into perspective. When we look back and say, okay, this is the end of my life. Now, what did it mean? What, what have I accomplished? Who am I? How did it benefit somebody? We have all these questions in our mind. So today I want to take everybody on a hypothetical journey to the end of your life. And remember, it is going to be hypothetical, so there's no need to be afraid or anything like that. A hypothetical journey to the end of your life. And I want to stand there with you and look back over our existence on this earth. I want us to step back, look back, and look back at our life and everything that we've accomplished, everything that we are, everything that we are known as, and I want to look back over our life with you, mine included. I want everybody to go hypothetically to the end of your life and look back over everything and see how we're doing here. <clears throat> but before we do this, I want to show you an actual account of a king who lived his life like many people still do today. This king was someone who God really loved and spent a lot of time and devotion to help him learn and to grow. God pours a lot of time into this guy. He's not someone we often think about God spending a lot of time training and developing. He wasn't even a king of Israel. He was actually a pagan king in Babylon. He wasn't even part of God's people, God's chosen people, Israel. He's outside of the story. And God pours a lot of time into developing the character of this person. Nebuchadnezzar's story takes up several chapters in the book of Daniel, but they carry an invaluable lesson for us. And I want to look at his life. In chapter 1, we see that Nebuchadnezzar has taken the nation of Israel into captivity. And in chapter 2, we see God step in and start stirring things up for Nebuchadnezzar's life. So I want to go to the point where God starts stirring things up to see God's, God's connection to his life. So let's look at Daniel chapter 2 and verse 1. It says, Now in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams, and his spirit was so troubled that his sleep left him. God gives Nebuchadnezzar a bad dream, and he introduces himself through that dream. He, he's, he's opening up Nebuchadnezzar's story. He says, I want to introduce myself to you. Nebuchadnezzar's next action shows us his level of arrogance. He is the top of the top. He's the top of the stack. Nebuchadnezzar knows he's the king of all kings. He is the, the, the world power at the time. He wanted things his way, and he wanted it his way right now. And you'll see, you'll see his personality come through here. Look at verse 2. Then the king gave the command to all the magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans to tell the king his dream. So they came and stood before the king. And the king said to them, I have had a dream, and my spirit is anxious to know the dream. Then the Chaldeans spoke to the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream and we will give the interpretation. So the king tells them that he's had a bad dream and he wants to know what this dream means. I really need to know the interpretation. I know it's deeper than just a dream. I want to know what this dream means. Then, he, then 
the wise men asked Nebuchadnezzar to tell them, just tell us what the dream is and we'll go ahead and tell you what the interpretation of that dream is. But that wasn't good enough for Nebuchadnezzar. He, he wanted more than this. So look at verse 5. It says, The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, My decision is firm. If you do not make known the dream to me and its interpretation, you shall be cut into pieces and your houses shall be made an ash heap. However, if you tell the dream and its interpretation, you shall receive gifts, rewards, and great honor. Therefore, tell me the dream and its interpretation. Talk about pressure. This, this is not a happy scenario right here. Not only do you have to answer the question, you have to tell me what the question is. It, sure, no problem. Anybody can do that, right? You know, I, I don't only want you to tell me what the dream means. I want to know that you know what the dream is, and then you tell me what the dream means. I'm not even going to tell you what it is. You tell me the dream, and then you tell me what the dream means. And as unfair as this is, Nebuchadnezzar is actually making a very smart move here. If these guys are who they say they are, and can really do what they say they can really do, this shouldn't be a problem. But they weren't. So it was. The, if, if you guys are really these people who are in touch with the gods, then you should be able to tell me what the dream is and the interpretation of the dream. Look at verse 10. It says, Now the Chaldeans answered the king and said, There is not a man on earth who can tell the king's matter. Therefore, no king, lord, or ruler has ever asked such things of any magician, astrologer, or Chaldean. It is a difficult thing that the king requests, and there is no other who can tell it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. Now they make a very good point here. Only God could do something like this. You want us to tell you what the dream was and then the interpretation of it? Only God could do something like this. And that's a very good point. But in that one statement, they accidentally admitted to information that they really didn't want out there. They don't have a connection with God. They are complete fakes. The, uh, we are not who we say we are. We don't have this magical ability. We're not in tune with God at all. We are complete imposters. So Nebuchadnezzar's call was good. If you are who you say you are, then tell me the dream. And then tell me the interpretation. And their answer is only God could do something like that. Well, then talk to him. Ask him. You know, we don't have a connection with him. So, so we're really not who we say we were. Look at verse uh, 12 here. It says, For this reason the king was angry and very furious, and gave the command to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. So the decree went out, and they began killing the wise men. And they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. Nebuchadnezzar did not get the answer he wanted, so he commands that all the wise men be put to death. And it says that they went out and they began killing them. Some people have died because of this whole scenario. Some people are dying because they could not interpret the dream or tell them the dream and then interpret the dream. In chapter 1, we see that Daniel and his three friends are placed into this position of part of the wise men. Isn't that great? They make it there just in time to face the events of chapter 2. God exalts them to a position of a wise man, and now chapter 2 happens, and now the hunt is out to kill all the wise men. Isn't that, isn't that great? God, God promotes you to this position, and now that's the position at risk. So um, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are now in the position of being wise men just in time, just in time to have all the wise men executed. And when they come to kill Daniel and his friends, Daniel has a few questions, which is to be expected. If somebody walks in your door and they say, I'm here to kill you, you, you got a couple questions you would like answered before they do that. You know, why, why are, why? That, that's the main question. Why do you want to kill me? So let's look at verse 14 of chapter 2. Then with counsel and wisdom, Daniel answered Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, who had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. He answered and said to Arioch, the king's captain, Why is the decree from the king so urgent? Then Arioch made the decision known to Daniel. So Daniel went in and asked the king to give him time that he might tell the king the interpretation. So now we're going to jump ahead in the story quite a bit. 
God does tell Daniel the dream and he tells Daniel what it means. So Daniel is able to go to the king and do what nobody else could do because Daniel does have a connection with God. He does, have, he does know who to get the information from. So he asked the king, could you just give me a little bit of time? I'll get you the answer and I'll be able to tell you the dream. Just give me a little bit of time. And Nebuchadnezzar says, fine, you've got a little bit of time. Daniel comes back in. He's able to give the, the king the, the dream and the interpretation. And this dream is the dream of the statue that's made out of the many different materials um, symbolizing the different kingdoms of the world. That's what this dream is. Daniel not only tells him the dream, but he tells him the interpretation of the dream, revealing that God is the one true God. The God that I'm in touch with is the one true God. This is where God introduces himself to King Nebuchadnezzar. God's giving personal attention to this king. Now, a lot of times we look at the Bible and we say, well, God helped this king of Israel and this king of Israel and exalted this person to be a king of Israel. And we see those stories all the time. This isn't an Israelite story. The Israelites are in captivity, but God is taking one-on-one -on -one time with a pagan king. This king is the king of Babylon. Let's look at verse 46 and what happens after he gets the dream and the interpretation. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face prostrate before Daniel and commanded that they should present an offering and incense to him. The king answered Daniel and said, Truly, your God is the God of gods, the Lord of kings and a revealer of secrets, since you could reveal this secret. Nebuchadnezzar is beginning to understand how big Daniel's God really is. But there's still a lot of training to do in Nebuchadnezzar's life. There's still a lot. He's not just saying, you know, I'm following your God 100%. He's starting to see that Daniel's God is the real God. And Daniel's faith is the true faith. But there's a lot of learning that still has to be done in Nebuchadnezzar's life. When we open up chapter 3, we see Nebuchadnezzar with all of his arrogance intact. He, he's still arrogant. He's still top of the stack. He has met God, but he's still not submitted to God in chapter 3. In this chapter, we see that Nebuchadnezzar has set up a huge golden image, and he's requesting that everybody bow down and worship that image. The only problem was Daniel... Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael, which are more commonly known as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, refuse to worship any god but the one true God. These guys aren't going to bow. This presents a problem for them, seeing that there were some serious consequences for not obeying the king's orders. You bow down or there will be consequences. So let's look at the consequences in verse 4 of Daniel chapter 3. Then a herald cried out, To you it is commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that at the time you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery, in symphony, with all kinds of music, you shall fall down and worship the gold image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Here again we see the violent arrogance of King Nebuchadnezzar. Death to all who do not abide by my wishes. That's just how the guy rolls. You don't do what I say to do, then you die. That, that's just how it goes. And as the story goes on, we see that these young men refuse to bow. They will not bow and worship this golden image that the king set up, and they're thrown into the fiery furnace. But in all this, God introduces himself to Nebuchadnezzar again. He makes sure Nebuchadnezzar knows that he's part of this story. After they're thrown in, God stands in the fire and protects these three men, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael, and we all know them as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, which are the names that they were given under Babylonian rule. They're in the fire, and God decides that he's going to stand in the fire and protect them. He's in there too. And he makes sure that Nebuchadnezzar does not miss this detail. I want you to see this. So look at verse 24. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished, and he rose in haste and spoke, saying to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? And they answered and said to the king, True, O king. Look, he answered, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. 
Nebuchadnezzar doesn't miss this detail. He turns around to see his accomplishment. I threw him in the fiery furnace. Their story's over because they didn't obey me. And then he loses count. Right, one, two, three, four. Yeah, we threw three guys in there. One, two, three, four. So he goes to his counselors. Did we throw three guys in? Yes, we did. I see four. And the fourth one looks like the Son of God. What's going on here? This same God who revealed his dream to him has now revealed himself in a way that defies Nebuchadnezzar's power and authority. You say they are to die, I say they are not to die. So now God has not only introduced himself by revealing a dream to Nebuchadnezzar, now he reintroduces himself as the one who can defy the king and get away with it. Uh, your power and your authority that's not the real thing. It's my power and my authority. You say they are to die, I say they are to live. And they live. Nebuchadnezzar thought he was the one in charge, but now he sees that there is a greater power than himself. I said they are to die, but now they're walking around and they have company. They are walking in the fire with somebody. Who volunteered to go into the fire with these three guys? But they're not hurt. They're being protected. Somebody's got greater authority and greater power than I do. So God is opening Nebuchadnezzar's eyes. And I want you to see who I am. I want to introduce myself to you. Look at verse 28. Nebuchadnezzar spoke saying, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him, and they have frustrated the king's word and yielded their bodies that they should not serve nor worship any god except their own god. <clears throat> you see Nebuchadnezzar's story just turned around again, and he says, well, points go to their god again. You know, it just turns out that this god, it seems to be a little bit more powerful than I am. He seems to be able to make the calls. Nebuchadnezzar is not only impressed by the power of God, but he's impressed by the dedication of God's people. I'm seeing something different about this small group of people. These guys were willing to die in order to get the message out that their God is the one true God. They were willing to lose their life for it. And the one true God was the one who had the power to overrule the king's wishes with absolutely no consequences to himself. I overrule your call. But even after all this, Nebuchadnezzar is really not ready to humble himself in order to submit to God's desires. <clears throat> so God has to take it all to a very personal level to get Nebuchadnezzar's attention. But something has changed by chapter 4. Something has happened between chapter 3 and chapter 4 that is not written down for us. We do Something's going on here, but there is a total change in the way Nebuchadnezzar operates in chapter 4. God actually inspires Nebuchadnezzar to speak. We now have a narrative by Nebuchadnezzar himself. And I don't know if you've ever read through the book of Daniel, you, maybe you missed this, but I think this is fascinating. Nebuchadnezzar is the one writing here. The pagan... Babylonian king, not in the group of Israel, but this pagan Babylonian king, he's the one writing something down here. God's been working on Nebuchadnezzar since the events of chapter 3 happened, and I don't know everything he did, but Nebuchadnezzar has the desire to let the world know about one specific thing that God did do. And these next words are written by Nebuchadnezzar himself. Something has completely changed about him. Look at chapter 4 and verse 1. <clears throat> Nebuchadnezzar the king, to all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. I thought it good to declare the signs and wonders that the Most High God has worked for me. How great are his signs and how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion is from generation to generation. King Nebuchadnezzar, that's what he is saying right there. He is praising God for all that God has done for him. And he's acknowledging the greatness of God's kingdom, not his own kingdom. <clears throat> Something's different. The guy that we saw with the violent arrogance in chapter 1, 2, and 3 is not the same guy we're looking at in chapter 4. 
He says, I just want to praise God whose kingdom will last from generation to generation. It is his dominion. King Nebuchadnezzar is praising God. The one true most high God. It seems strange considering all that we've seen about Nebuchadnezzar up to this point. So he takes us through a flashback. And I love the fact that Nebuchadnezzar is the, he's the one telling the story here. He takes us through a flashback to let us know what, what made such a huge turnaround in his life. You want to know what happened to me? I'm going to let you know what happened to me. Look at verse 4 of chapter 4. <clears throat> I, Nebuchadnezzar, that tells you who's talking here, who's writing it down. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in my house, in flourishing in my palace. I saw a dream which made me afraid, and the thoughts on my bed and the visions of my head troubled me. Notice that he's speaking of his kingdom, his house, his palace. That's how the story starts. I want to tell you, I was in my kingdom. I was in my house. It's my palace. Then he tells us that he had another bad dream which frightened him. It was a dream about a tree that grows up strong and tall. It says that you could see it over the whole earth. This tree was so tall. And the voice came from heaven saying, cut the tree down and take it down to just a stump and leave the stump and the roots. But cut the tree down. Then he hears a voice speak about the tree as if he's speaking about a man. So let's look at that in verse 15. Nevertheless, leave the stump and the roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze. In the tender grass of the field, let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let him graze with the beasts on the grass of the earth. Let his heart be changed from that of a man, let him be given the heart of a beast, and let seven times pass over him. It says that the person that the tree represents will graze with beasts, his heart will be like the heart of a beast for seven times or seven years is what that means. The tree, the one that this tree represents, let him graze in the field like an animal. Let the dew fall on him. Let him have the heart of a beast for seven years. <clears throat> and of course this shakes Nebuchadnezzar up a little bit. And he again sends for Daniel to find out what this means. What does that dream mean? That's when Daniel gives him the answer that he feared the most. This tree represents you, King Nebuchadnezzar. The tree that you saw in your dream, that's you. It was a message that God was going to bring him low. I'm going to bring you down to nothing, Nebuchadnezzar. This tall tree that everybody enjoys the shade Everybody enjoys the fruit of that tree and the magnificence of that tree. I'm going to cut it down to just a stump in the roots. I'm going to bring you low. God loved Nebuchadnezzar. But Nebuchadnezzar refused to humble himself and submit to God and his leading in his life. He did not want, he was the king. He was the great one. So he did not want to humble himself under the authority of God. So God does one more drastic move to get his attention. The warning wasn't enough to get him to turn around, though. Daniel says, the tree represents you, king. This is what's going to happen to you. Here's the warning. But that wasn't enough to turn him around. The warning wasn't enough. So 12 months later, God made the fulfillment of the dream a reality to the king. Look at verse 28. All this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of the 12 months... He was walking about the royal palace of Babylon. The king spoke, saying, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty? Here's that arrogance we've come to know and love about King Nebuchadnezzar. We, here's that arrogance still intact. But pride comes before a fall, and Nebuchadnezzar is about to take the plunge of a lifetime. Your pride is so high, King Nebuchadnezzar, you think you're so much. And when you exalt yourself to that kind of height, God does say that pride comes before a fall. So don't lift yourself up too high because the fall will be great. And Nebuchadnezzar is about to take a huge plunge. While he's standing there bragging about all the great things that he has accomplished 
and how great he is, God steps in to interrupt his egotistic celebration. I see you partying there, Nebuchadnezzar, and you're telling everybody how great you are and all your accomplishments, but God just speaks in. He steps in and interrupts everything. Verse 31. <clears throat> While the word was still in the king's mouth, a voice fell from heaven. King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. The kingdom has departed from you. And they shall drive you from men, and your dwelling shall be with the beast of the field. They shall make you eat grass like oxen, and seven times, or seven years, shall pass over you, until you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men, and gives it to whomever he chooses. That very hour, the word was fulfilled concerning Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from men, and ate grass like oxen. His body was wet with the dew, of heaven till his hair had grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. And there you have it. Isn't that a precious little story? The king of the world power at that time has been brought so low. He lost his mind and became like an animal for seven years. It says his nails grew the hair grew like eagle's feathers, and he is out in the field, lost his mind. He went insane, and he is acting like an animal for seven years. This was the greatest king of that time, brought low and humbled to a position of livestock. I told you I'm going to cut the tree down to a stump. But I'm going to leave the roots because I still love you. And I still want your story, so I'm going to let the life still come into that stump. And I'm not removing you all together. I'm just trying to get a message across to you. God has allowed his kingdom to remain intact. And at the end of the seven years, Nebuchadnezzar was brought back to his senses and restored to his position as king. At the end of his story, he looks back over his entire existence and leaves us with one final message. God lets him communicate the final thought that we have on Nebuchadnezzar's life. He is the one writing again. Look at verse 37. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of Heaven, all of whose works are truth and his ways justice, and those who walk in pride, he is able to put down. That's the final thought we have on Nebuchadnezzar's life. Praise God. Thank him for everything. And if you think he can't bring you low, let me tell you a story. <laughs> Seven years I spent in a field. Seven years I went from king to livestock. This God of all heaven, the one true God, for those who walk in pride, he is able to put you down. He will bring you low. Nebuchadnezzar's story is about a man who took a lifetime to learn what was really important. It took him a lifetime. And even though most of his life was wasted living it for himself, God used the testimony of a wasted life to cry out to the rest of the world to pay attention now. Don't wait till the end of your life when you're looking back over everything, wondering what you accomplished and who you really were. Get the message right now. Don't throw it all away. Don't stand there with regrets looking back. Right now, hear the message. Pay attention right now. It doesn't matter what your life has consisted of. What matters is what you do with the rest of it. Please hear this message. Are there mistakes in my past? Absolutely. Are there things I wish I never did? Uh, yes. I could have handled that better. I could have handled that better. Mistakes I've made. Things I, I, if I could go back and change them, I would. But I can't be defined by my past. What matters is what I'm going to do from this point on with the rest of my life. That's what I can do something about. I can't do anything about what's already over. Nebuchadnezzar had everything at his disposal. He had money. He had fame. He had honor, prestige. He had everything. He had all of it. But in the end, he realized that it all 
paled in comparison to how important it was to honor God as the one true king and authority of his life. Like the last thing we hear from Nebuchadnezzar is, everybody listen, I will praise him, the king of heaven, and I will honor him. And I want everybody to know, submit to God. Make him the authority of your life because it doesn't matter what position you have in life. You got it because of the position that he's in. So praise him. Not the story that we, not the way that we would have saw Nebuchadnezzar's story end, but it's an exciting end. And God used him to write down those words. I just want to tell you about our awesome God. The theme of Nebuchadnezzar's life was clearly himself. Until God humbled him to the point of looking past himself, and that's when the theme changed. Nebuchadnezzar's theme completely changed. The theme was no longer about the king of Babylon. It was about the king of heaven. Look at the end of his story. The theme is totally different. It was no longer about worshiping himself. It was about worshiping God. It was no longer about holding on to his pride, but letting it all go for the glory of God and get the message out to everybody else. Let your pride go and submit to God. Make him the theme of your life. Make him the theme. The whole theme changed when he finally took time to consider it all. Nebuchadnezzar learned that the power that, that he possessed was only because God gave it to him in the first place. I am a king because God allowed me to be in this position. I am who I am because God gave me everything that I have. Praise the king of heaven, the most high, the one that I am now submitting my entire life under. Praise him. Pilate had the same problem when he was about to crucify Jesus Christ, if you remember that. He was going through that same issue. He was about to have Christ crucified and Jesus had to remind him about what reality really was. Let's look at this verse in John chapter 19 and verse 10. Then Pilate said to him, are you not, are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have power to crucify you and power to release you? And Jesus answered, you could have no power at all against me unless it has been given to you from above. You, you don't have the power to crucify me. You don't have the power to release me. What's going to happen is going to happen because it's his will, not because it's your will. You are where you are because God has put you where you are. God has given you everything that you have. And Jesus corrects Pilate. Pilate was telling Jesus that he was the only one who stu stands on center stage. I am the one on center stage, Jesus. I am the one with the power to crucify you or release you. Look at center stage. I'm standing right in the middle of it. And Jesus then tells him about who created that stage. That turns everything around. I'm on center stage. The stage you're standing on was given to you from above. You are only where you are because God gave that to you. One day I drew my first breath. You have that same story. One day we drew our first breath <clears throat> because God created us. We now possess everything in our lives because God gave those to you. God gave that to me. The things that I have is because God provided that. And we get to continue drawing breaths until the very last day of our life because God continues to provide us with another breath. That is why we get to do this. Not because we have done something, but because he is good and he has given this to us. And my personal commitment in my life is that I cannot allow anything to get in the way of blessing him back. In the month of November, we celebrate Thanksgiving. Thank you for what? Everything we have, everything, that, that breath that I just took, thank you. Thank you for letting me be part of your story. Thank you for the blessings, the children, the, my spouse. Thank you for my friends. Thank you for this church. Thank you for the word of God. Thank you that it's a cool day, but I'm not freezing because there's some heat. <laughs> Thank you for what you've given. Thank you. And I can't allow anything to get in the way of be a blessing back to him because he definitely deserves it. 
if anything in our life inhibits us from being a blessing to God, then our lives are under the wrong theme. We have the wrong theme. God should be the overall theme of everything we are because everything we have has been given to us by Him. He should be the theme of everything because He's the theme of everything. We have everything because He is the theme. And when we lose our focus on that, we change our theme. And our life becomes about other things. And we're derailing what it should be. Look at James chapter 1 and verse 17. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. You want to know where the good things came from in your life? It's right there. God gave those to you. That child you get to hold, that loved one that you get to hug, that friend that you get to talk to, the vehicle that you drove here today, the website that you are watching the sermon on, if you're watching the sermon on a website, everything has been given to you from Him. You have it all because He gave it all to you. If we're able to stand together at the end of our lives, if we were able to do this, and all of us were able to stand right now at the end of all of our lives, and we were able to look back over everything we have done, would we be able to say that God was truly the theme of everything we did? Why did you do that? Because of Him. Why did you love that person? Because of Him. Why did you not blow up in that situation? Oh, because of Him. Why did you handle it that way? Because the theme of my life was Him. Would we all be able to say that? Or would we look back over our life and say, Wow, that was so not within that theme. <laughs> I handled that and that brought no glory to God whatsoever. That did not complement God as the theme. If we were all able to stand at the end of our life and look back, would we be able to look back and say God was truly the theme all the way through? And I'm guessing a lot of us would sit here saying, no. Well, could you say that you truly strove to be a blessing to him throughout your life? All the way through? Probably not. And if the answer is no, if we haven't, are we willing to rewrite that story now? Today? From this time, on this day, let's get rid of everything in the past. Let's, let's lose that. And let's say at the end of our life, we look back to this point right here. Could we say God was our theme? That's yet to be determined. I don't know. I hope that's what we will do. I hope that's the heart that we have, that God was our, our theme all the way through. See, Nebuchadnezzar had to go through so much in order for God to get his attention. But at the end, he became a testimony to the one true God. He, be, he became a strong testimony. When God is the theme of your life, everything in your life complements the theme. It'd be really irritating to watch a movie that didn't have a theme. It'd be frustrating. I don't even know what it's about. There's no theme. <laughs> when there's a theme, everything else complements the theme. You might like a movie because of the theme. But if, there's, if you keep changing themes, then you lose focus, you lose attention. So when God's the theme of your life, everything's going to complement that theme. <clears throat> and you do have a theme that your life follows. Every one of you do. Me included. We all have a theme that our life follows. And I'm not sure what that theme is, but it does exist. We all have a theme. Maybe it's to gain something. Maybe it's to change something. Maybe it's to be something or to build something. But there is a theme. There is a theme in your life. Nebuchadnezzar tried it all. But at the end, he, uh, he relays a message to all of us. Make God the theme. Well, you didn't do it, but I should have. I should have done it. Why didn't you? Because I was the theme. My kingdom was the theme. It was all about me. And God brought me down so low to let me know 
It was never all about me. I had everything I have because he's so good. And the theme was God. And it should have been God all the way through. So my challenge to everyone, the whole world, let me declare to the whole world, make God the theme. Make God the theme. But I want to attach a warning to that message right there. If you decide to make God the theme that everything in your life complements, Satan will send a new theme in your life for you to consider. He is going to, hey, try that theme. Look at that one. He's going to send you some new themes to consider. Things to be offended about. Things for you to judge. Things to occupy your time instead of growing in Christ. And the list continues to go on. He'll offer all these different things that you can focus on. New themes. He'll use your children. He'll use your jobs. He'll use your hobbies or anything else to introduce as an option to become the new theme. And he's, he's going to send options your way. We must keep God as the theme of our story in every aspect of our life. He's the theme. And if you don't want him to be the theme, you can try to change that. But the bottom line is God is still the theme. You have everything you have because God gave you everything you have. All the blessings in your life came from him. So make him the theme of your life. If we don't, then we are telling a story with a, different, a completely different theme altogether. You're relaying to the world a message that you really don't want to relay to the world. You want to relay the, to the world the message that God is the theme. And I believe that's the heart of all of us in here. <clears throat> we want people to see him. <coughs> we want them to know that he's all of it. He's everything. Whatever the theme of your life is, <clears throat> is exactly what will influence the people of your life. If it's all about you, that's how you're going to influence the people of your life. If it's all about making money, that's how you will influence the people of your life. If it's all about God, then that is how you will influence the people of your life. <clears throat> Make God the theme. My, the message I want everybody to hear this morning is make God the theme. Are you going to go through rough times? Yes. Are you going to have struggles? Are you going to be discouraged? Yes. I promise you it's coming. Make God the theme. What if people treat you bad? He hasn't. Make him the theme. Follow him. And maybe your theme isn't God. Maybe you're living a life right now that doesn't point to him. I'm asking you to reconsider changing the story from this moment on. And from the rest of our life, let's all stand at the end of our life and look back over the whole thing to this moment right here. Was this church a church that decided to make God the theme from this moment to the end of their life? And my prayer is that every one of us will make God the theme. Stand with me this morning. Dear me, Father, I thank you for using Nebuchadnezzar.